All right, so today we're going to predominantly be talking about economic statement conversion. <clears throat> Put up lecture note three last week. And basically, this is going to be core to what we're going to be focusing on when we get into the valuation. Right? So I had mentioned this previously, but one of the things that's sort of new and different about this class is that we are going to follow Bigliani <laughs> Miller as a way of doing valuation. And this is a graphical representation of Medigliani Miller. It was really explained in the readings in the McKinsey book for this week. And so the idea is a company's worth the sum of its future cash flows. And what's important is we're going to break them into what's called operating cash flows and non-operating cash flows. Right? So operating cash flows are going to be defined as the things that we need to do on a regular basis <clears throat> in order to sell to our customers the products and services that we deliver. Right? That's operating. It's why we're in business. Right? But we can also have what are called non-operating cash flows. So for example, we can be Yahoo and we could have gotten lucky and bought 30% of Alibaba before they went public. And so we're generating cash flow because we happen to own another company that we have nothing to do with. We won the lottery, right? That's a non-operating asset. Now here's the point, it has value, so it's not like we're gonna ignore it, but we're gonna value it separately than the running the business day to day of a search engine and web properties, okay? That would be the operating part of Yahoo. So we'll add the two together <clears throat> and that will be called enterprise value or EV for short. Right? And it is the enterprise value which we will then use to distribute to the debt and the equity holders. Since debt has a priority, we pay off all of the debt first. Residual belongs to the shareholders divided by shares, share price. That's enterprise DCF, again, which you learned in the readings for last week. So <clears throat> what we're going to do in this class is take the McKinsey approach, which is also not even used by most of the Wall Street banks, is we're going to map accounting statements to Medigliani Miller, okay? Since that's the, the valuation format that we're going to do, and by mapping them to Medigliani Miller, we will get the two benefits that I previously described. Number one, it'll make the analysis more straightforward, and two, it'll actually make the valuations more straightforward and more insightful. But that's not something you learn anywhere else. Nobody else teaches it this way. This is a McKinsey-driven approach to understanding Medigliani Miller valuation, and this is something that is unique to this class. Now, it doesn't mean <clears throat> that once you do this approach, you can't understand the other approaches, but this is a little bit more of a formalized approach. Okay? So, in order to help you do this, <clears throat> I was mentioning to the last class that I used to be involved a while back in what McKinsey calls their analyst training program. That was my exposure to this. And basically what happens is if you're hired as a McKinsey analyst, they send you to ATP, and it's basically a five-week boot camp, and it's an MBA in a box. Except a lot of McKinsey hires are not business majors. They're like, you know, poets or nuclear engineers, you know, or statisticians who never learned anything about accounting. And I was there, and I had four hours to teach them everything we're doing this semester. Okay? They had to learn it in four hours. Pretty, pretty much a, you know... Uh, a very fast uh, throw it in the pool philosophy. So I had to, in very quick format, teach people who didn't know how to do accounting to learn how to take accounting statements and convert them into this Midigliani format, Midigliani Miller format. So I came up with my own teaching convention that exists nowhere in the textbook, nowhere else in the world. And if you talk to anybody about what we're talking about in this version of the class, they'll look at you like you're nuts. All right? But I think it'll help you understand what we're about to do. So I came up with these mnemonics, right? And specifically, <laughs> operating cash flows, I started referring to as box one or bucket one. Non-operating cash flows, bucket two. Debt cash flows, bucket three. Equity cash flows, bucket four. So enterprise value, one plus two, equals three plus four. In fact, enterprise DCF, one plus two minus three equals four, okay? <coughs> Now, the reason why I came up with the mnemonic is because we're going to remap accounting statements into this Medigliani-Miller format. So that's what's on the next slide. 
This slide is a representation of the process that we're going to go through. And it's a three-step process. And this middle step is really what's new because in other classes and in the real world, people go directly from one to three and they skip this whole remapping statement process that I'm going to show you. So here's the idea. We're going to start out with accounting statements, gap accounting statements. And to map them, we're going to rearrange them into the Medigliani-Miller format. So we'll take the income statement. The rearranged income statement is going to be called TII, Total Income Available to Investors, a McKinsey made-up term that represents the Medigliani-Miller income statement remapped. Okay, And it's going to have four parts. All of these statements are going to have four parts. Operating, non-operating, debt, equity. So one of the other pieces that's going to be new is I'm going to institute something called a labeling process. So if you ever played with a bunch of Legos and you had this Lego toy and you ripped it apart and you put it back together, what's very important is you can't have any Legos left on the floor, right? Because we're taking statements that balance that the accountants gave us and when we rearrange them into the new version of the statements, we can't leave anything behind and have unbalancing statements, right? They might add up to a different number and we'll reshuffle them, but it's still all the same accounts have to be accounted for on the new version of the statements that were on the old version of the statements, otherwise things won't add up. Okay, So we can't leave any Legos on the floor. So back to this. The way we're going to remap is we're going to take all of our ones, all of our labeled ones that are operating, and we're going to put those together on the income statement, and that's going to create something called no pat or no plat. No plat is the McKinsey term. No pat is the non-McKinsey term. Basically it's the same thing, but it's the operating cash flows from the income statement. Then we're going to take the non-operating twos from the income statement that we've labeled. We're going to put those together and that's going to give us the non-operating profits, non-operating income from the income statement. We're then going to add them together and that's going to get us total income available to investors, TII. And that is going to equal the payment on the funds flow side to those investors. The payment to the debt holders will be all the threes, all the interest-bearing debt payments, the interest expense, and the payment to the equity holders, in this case, the net income. So we'll remap the income statement to Midigliani Miller. We're then going to remap the balance sheet to Midigliani Miller. All of the assets and liabilities that are operating will be put into bucket one called invested capital. So invested capital is all of the operating assets minus the operating liabilities. That's invested capital. We'll then take off the balance sheet all of the non-operating assets and non-operating liabilities. We'll bundle them together, and that'll be the non-operating capital. You add those two together, total funds available to investors, TFI. And the funds that are funding that TFI all of the threes, all of the debt off the balance sheet, all of the interest-bearing debt, and all of the fours, all of the equity items in the balance sheet. So TFI is the long-term funding of the business, the long-term debt and equity of the business, equals the assets, the operating and the non-operating assets. Now, it doesn't matter whether we rearrange the income statement or balance sheet first. You can do one or the other. However, you must have both statements rearranged to create statement number three, which is called the cash flow available to investors statement, CFI. And that's the important one for valuation, right? Because cash flow is basically defined as cash from the income statement minus cash reinvested in the balance sheet. Therefore, cash from the income statement minus change in balance sheet equals cash flow. So what we'll do is we'll take that process and we'll go through it four times. The no plat minus the change in invested capital, free cash flow. That's the operating cash flow of the business. The non-operating profits minus the non-operating investments, change in non-operating investments, non-operating cash flow. Free cash flow plus non-operating cash flow, CFI cash flow available to investors. 
and it is that cash flow that can be distributed to the debt and equity holders. So all of the interest payments and any new debt that we issue or debt that we pay off, change in the debt is the cash flow to the debt holders. All of the actual payments to the shareholders, which we'll call dividends, and then change in equity on the balance sheet gives us the cash flow available to the shareholders, and that came from the CFI. Now, when we do valuation, when we forecast those, when we forecast the free cash flows, we get the operating value of the firm. We forecast the non-operating cash flows, we get the non-operating value of the firm. We add those two together, we get the enterprise value, which equals the cash available for the debt holders and the equity value of the firm over time. So the other nice thing about the reformatting that we're going to do is it gives a nice symmetry because we can either move across or we can move up or down. It also gives us two other advantages by going through this approach. Number one, it makes the valuations easier and more straightforward because we have a clean line for valuing each one of these streams of cash flows. And advantage number two, it makes the analytics much, straight, more, much more straightforward. Matter of fact, what's the definition the actual mathematical formula of ROIC. What's in the numerator? I'm sorry? Yeah, the, the numerator is no plat. What's in the denominator for ROIC? It's no plat divided by what? Invested capital. Well, there's my no plat, there's my invested capital. So that's the point. The components of what we're going to use in the formula are right here in the re rearranged statements. So it actually makes it cleaner for us to do it. Right? The final piece of this that's really going to matter is we get what I call balancing statements, meaning the cash flows equals the cash paid out. Or the, this side of the statement has to equal that side of the statement. And that's the thing. In other classes, they don't teach you to do both sides of the statements. In this class, you will learn to track where the money went that was generated. All right, so most people just stop at free cash flow, but they don't actually show you where that free cash flow went. In this class, we're going to look at both sides. Where do we generate the money? Where do we spend the money? And those two have to balance. Now, that's important because it mitigates errors because we could actually come up with a free cash flow that's incorrect, and we have no idea that we made a mistake. When we balance it out, if we don't balance it, then if it doesn't balance, we know we made a mistake. Right? So a correct answer in this class is not just getting to the right number. It's actually showing a balanced statement because a balanced statement means that you can reconcile to the right answer both ways. So every time you turn in a solution in this class, you have to show the balancing statements. So a correct answer is not just the number. The number without balancing statements is an incorrect answer and you don't get credit for that. All right? Because I'll give you an example. If the answer is 100, but one of the sides of your statement says 100 and the other side of your statement says 200, then you had a 50-50 chance of being right. Well, that's not the level of certainty we're looking for in this class. All right? So you need 100 on both sides of the statement if 100 is the right answer. Okay? So that's what we're going to try and do when we go through these statements. All right. Now, how is this different than the real world? This is really a conceptual way of thinking about the business. In the real world, people take shortcuts. People use conventions. It doesn't mean they're wrong, but what you'll start to understand in this class is when people take a shortcut or when people are going against and creating a convention that might be slightly different than the theory. So again, when we go through this class, and it should start to make logical sense how all these things fit together, when you see somebody else doing it differently, it doesn't mean they're wrong, it just means they're doing it in a slightly different way, and you'll know what their differences are, and you'll better understand the different approaches. And I'll give you an example. It starts with Bloomberg. So in my opinion, Bloomberg does not give you a good definition of ROIC. And Bloomberg is the standard <clears throat> by which Wall Street calculates ROIC <clears throat> and by which all of the academic classes have taught you ROIC. Right? And I want to show you the conceptual difference between the approach McKinsey takes 
and the approach we're going to take in this class and the approach most people take in the real world and which you've learned in other academic settings. So they're on the left and right hand side of this PowerPoint slide. Now here's the deal. What is ROIC? It's no plat divided by invested capital. Now generally no plat is calculated fairly consistently. It's the operating profit after tax, so no plat is EBIT times one minus tax rate. Where there's differences is in the invested capital. So in both cases, the accountants do us a disservice because they give us assets equals liabilities and equity, but they divide assets and liabilities into current and long term. What's going to matter to us is whether the liabilities are nibbles or ibbles. Nibbles stand for non-interest-bearing liabilities, and Ibbles stand for interest-bearing liabilities. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the accounting balance sheet, and we're going to reclassify things as interest-bearing or non-interest-bearing. So for example, accounts payable, non-interest-bearing. Bank debt, interest-bearing. So here's the deal. If I pay you in 30 days, and I don't owe you any more money, non-interest-bearing liability. If I pay you in 30 days and I owe you more money, interest-bearing liability. Okay, So <clears throat> one of the most common interest-bearing liabilities is debt. But I'll give you an example. Pension liabilities. Pension liabilities are present valued on an accounting statement, which means they grow over time. So therefore, interest-bearing by proxy. So it does get a little bit more convoluted, but generally debt is interest-bearing. Non-debt is non-interest-bearing for the most part. So... And in the real world, this is an adjustment people make. So the idea is we rearrange it, and we come up with our debt and equity. And what is return in invested capital? It's the return on the debt and the equity. That's the way most people define return in invested capital, the return in the debt and the equity. And that equals all of the assets minus the non-interest-bearing liabilities. Right? But here is my conceptual problem. What McKinsey's going to do, and we're going to learn how to do, is we're going to take those assets and we're going to further subdivide them into what's called operating assets and non-operating assets. And this is something in the real world people don't do because they just do the return of the debt and equity. Well, what is an operating asset? An operating asset is basically something we use to sell more products and services to our customers. It's the reason we're in business. It's the inventory, it's the facilities, it's the direct labor that we're basically putting into that inventory. It's the stuff that we actually use to make or sell our product or service. That's operating. And the point is, every time we sell another product or serve, deliver another service, we're going to need more of those operating assets. So they're recurring, and we'll need to spend them as we grow. A non-operating asset, as we defined earlier, has nothing to do with our business. Right? We don't need them to run our business. We just happen to have them, and they have value. Two of the most common non-operating assets today are excess cash and joint ventures. Apple's got $213 billion of cash sitting overseas. If you read the headlines over the week, Apple's about to do another giant debt issue because they're going to borrow money in the U.S. to pay dividends and buy back stock, and they don't want to bring their cash from the international sitting in Ireland back to the U.S., because they don't want to pay a 35% tax hit to move the money back to the U.S. Because we have this crazy tax policy. That's why there's all these inversions. But basically, in the U.S. tax code, there's $2.2 trillion worth of cash of profits that have been made by U.S. companies outside the U.S. that they don't want to repatriate because they don't want to pay a 35% tax hit. And they're hoping that in this election year that that will be one of the campaign issues to help jumpstart the economy is to give them a tax holiday so they can move all their money back. So companies like Apple are, are literally borrowing against their external cash hoard in the international markets to distribute money in the U.S., hoping that they can be tax-free when they eventually uh, convert it. But the point is, <clears throat> that's non-operating. And here's the thing. To sell the next $100 billion worth of iPhones... Does Apple really need to borrow another $200 billion worth of cash? Because if you think about it, that's what the return on debt and equity actually implies. See, the return on the debt and equity, which equals the assets, basically says, I need all of those assets to sell the next widget. 
And that just doesn't make sense because Apple is going to generate $60 billion of free cash flow this year, and Apple doesn't need to borrow any money. They have more than enough already in their business. So that's the point. The flaw in the definition that's used in the real world really matters when we do valuation because it can mislead you about the return and the cash generated on the incremental sale. Right? So that's the approach that McKinsey takes that's a little bit different. Now, here's why this happened. I go back to a simpler time. I told you, modern corporate finance was created at the University of Chicago in the mid-1970s. Bloomberg was started in 1981. The formulas in Bloomberg were created in 1981. 1981 was a much simpler time in the world of accounting and finance. We didn't have $2 trillion of cash sitting outside the U.S. because of our crazy corporate tax code back then. We didn't have billions of dollars put into joint ventures with all the IP and the pharma, the biotech, and the technology industries that we do today back in 1981. So what happened was because the non-operating assets were relatively trivial, it made sense for the academics and Wall Street to create formulas that represented invested capital on the left because invested capital wasn't other than there weren't many non-operating assets in invested capital. Well, in 2016, the world has dramatically changed. Now, there's a lot more non-operating assets. But the formulas have not. Right? And let me show you why this matters. Right? So, a couple years ago, I was asked to go to Molson Coors to speak at their leadership conference of the top 150 leaders. Actually, it was three years ago this month. Might have been or even around this week. And basically, every February, <clears throat> uh, they have this conference where they take the 150 and they go down to Florida, and it's the beginning of spring break for a lot of college students, and instead of a bunch of drunk 21-year-olds, it's a bunch of drunk 50-year-olds, all right? But it's basically, they have pool parties, they have rock music, there's beer everywhere, they're having a good old time, and it looks like... Microsoft, did you crash again? All right, hopefully it recovered. But long story short, it's just a party. And the reason I was brought down there is they they knew this because Bloomberg or not Bloomberg uh, Molson Coors, which is based in uh, Colorado, they have a Bloomberg terminal, and they knew that they were the worst performing beer company in the world. All right, in a golden age of alcohol where all these companies like AB InBev and all are, are literally like printing money in a five-year total return to shareholders. If you put money into Molson Coors, you lost money over a five-year period of time. So they wanted me to interrupt the pep rally to basically tell their leadership that you suck, right? And to give them the Wall Street perspective because they didn't want to ruin the party themselves. So I'm the outsider who gets to come in and do this. And I only had 30 minutes to tell them that they suck before they went back to their partying and other stuff that they do. And, and so I was speaking in a big ballroom. I was on stage, and on the stage, right in front of me, they were all sitting in round tables. We had some members of the Molson family. We had some members of the Coors family, big you know board members and shareholders at Big Stake that were very concerned about their values not going up. And senior leadership was there. Marketing was there. Finance was there, operations, all the, all the different from uh, senior leaders from all around the world. And here's the point. And I'm not going to give you anything confidential. I'm just going to use Bloomberg because that's what they told me to use as an outsider. Because even today, with current data, you can still see that they suck. So we'll go to TAP, which is Molson Coors. Type in RV. And we'll go to Custom. And we'll just use the standard definition of ROIC, which is a Bloomberg field, which is very heavily used by the financial community. And I'll do that for the latest filing, which will be 2015 for them. So this is a couple years later. And the answer is, this past year, 2.81% ROIC. And then we'll do WAC. And the answer is 7% whack. So they have a negative spread. That's why they weren't doing well. The industry is 11 to 2. They're earning 3. The industry's got a positive spread. They have a negative spread. Right? So what's the 
impact of growth. What happens when you grow a negative spread? You just do worse. And that was the point. They were growing really fast, this negative spread. So what do you think the message they thought I was going to deliver should be? What should I tell them? What should I tell them about growth? Yeah, stop it. Fix your business, then grow. But this growth in a negative spread is just destroying more and more value. It's all negative growth. All right, makes sense? There's the data to support it. This is what Wall Street's looking at. This is the conversation you're having with the analysts. So here's how I started my 30 minutes. People in the room, you guys are doing an amazing job. Keep up the growth. Um, you'll only create more value. Do more of it. Pat on the back. And this wasn't a joke. I was dead serious. Right? So here's why. Because I took the time to separate out the operating assets and the non-operating assets. If you go back to homework two, what did I have you do in Bloomberg? I had you create operating working capital. I had you create operating invested capital. I had you create operating ROIC. Straight out of Bloomberg. Because again, the accounts don't give it to us. And that's not the standard definition. So what I did is I said, well, let's look at the operating assets. Let's look at the actual assets the people in the room, 149 people, not the CEO, are actually using to sell beer. And then I recalculated that ROIC, operating ROIC, and that is 14%. So that's the point. They're actually making 14% selling beer. Well, how is the business making 3%? Because the business is the average of the operating and the non-operating. And so the problem with moles and cores was not the operating performance of the assets. It was actually a positive spread. The problem was in the non-operating assets. That moles and cores had a big joint venture with a company called SAB Miller. And it was a big black sucking hole of cash. In fact, they just sold it to ABI InBev. Right? Anheuser-Busch InBev is now it's their problem. They just bought a, a SAB Miller. But the point is... <coughs> is that this joint venture was not doing well at all, right? When Bloomberg is reporting ROIC, it's the return in the operating and the non-operating. So what that tells you is, well, I don't want to grow that because that's a negative spread. Now let's go back to our, our little diagram here. What Bloomberg is actually calculating is they're taking the NOPLAT, which is operating, and they're dividing it by what we would call TFI. So ROIC in the real world is the return in the TFI. It's not the return on the operating invested capital because it's blending the operating and the non-operating. So here's the point. Moles and cores, 14% operating ROIC, 3% average ROIC. What do you think the non-operating ROIC was? Really, really bad. How is this being interpreted? Slow your growth. You guys have a terrible beer business. If you look behind the veil, their beer business is healthy. What's killing the perception of Molson Coors is this joint venture, which has nothing to do with the people in the room that are actually running their assets. And I'm telling you, this is a real-world company that was ready to start swinging the axe and killing off their golden goose because the average ROIC was leading them astray, and Wall Street was the one beating the drums to their senior leaders to tell them that this is why you're screwing up, because Wall Street's getting the data right from Bloomberg. So this is what we're going to get smarter about in understanding it this semester. And here's the thing. When you go to your next finance class that teaches you valuation, or when you're hired by J.P. Morgan Chase, and they have you do ROIC the traditional way, I don't want you to either get fired or a professor to get pissed off and fail you because you're some punk kid telling them that they don't know what they're doing by trying to explain to them why they're wrong. What I do want you to understand, though, is when people do it a different way, what way they're doing it and what implications it has on the valuation and whether or not that they're taking a shortcut. Because people do take shortcuts in the real world. And I'm telling you, this is what's happening in the real world today. And a lot of bankers were trained at some very top schools in this historical academic environment that I think can be misleading. And that's why McKinsey cleans up. Because Goldman or Morgan will come in there and they'll give you the traditional definition. And McKinsey will come in there in a very common sense way and explain to you what I just did. And it makes the McKinsey people look like geniuses. And that's why they are constantly brought in to do due diligence on the valuations that the investment bankers give them. Right? It's not that they're smarter. 
It's just they're using an approach that I think is better because they're mapping it back to Bidigliani Miller. That's what I'm going to teach you this semester to think about differently. And that involves the conversion of these statements. I'll give you another example. Look at Apple. We talked about Apple and Google. Again, traditional ROIC for Apple. We did it when we did spread. What is the ROIC for Apple? It's 28%. What is it for Alphabet Google? It's 14%. That's the return on the debt and equity. For Apple, it's the return on the cash. That's the point. Apple's return on investment is the return on their cash. Google has 60 something billion dollars worth of cash. Google's return on investment is Google's return on cash. Microsoft's return on investment is Microsoft's return on cash because almost their entire assets are excess cash. Operating ROIC. Five hundred and three percent for Apple, thirty-four percent for Google for Alphabet. Okay, so as I said, we don't want to look at the business as the return on cash. We will misprice companies. Very sophisticated investors do this. I'm going to teach you to be a sophisticated investor. All right, so how do we do these conversions? Let's start with the in, with the balance sheet. This was the example right out of the book. So to save a little bit of time, I did this last class and what I'm going to do is on Elms I am going to put up the, uh, the in-class example as an Excel spreadsheet so you can follow along with what I'm going to do. So I'm going to put to the downloads folder, or, or the files folder, there we go. If you want to do it, you can also create your own. But in the files section, I'm going to put in a copy of this file called February 17th, which is today. <clears throat> this is the homework file or sorry, not the homework file, the uh, example in the book file just typed into Excel. So it'll help you with your homework. This is section 201. So, the idea is we're going to take this balance sheet, simple balance sheet on the left, and we're going to reorganize it to create this invested capital on the right. Or sorry, this statement of uh, TFI, total funds available to investors on the right. <coughs> so the first step <coughs> would be to go through the labeling process. So we go through line by line and we label everything one, two, three, or four. Operating one, non-operating two, debt equivalent three, equity equivalent cash flow for. Now, to help you with your homework and with your midterm, I'm going to give you the labels because I know you're not that familiar with accounting and you're not that familiar with the statements. And this is what I did in the ATP program in McKinsey. This is where I came up with the labels to make it easy to figure out what goes where. How do we put in the proper bucket? So I'll give you the labels and your homework assignment will look like this with everything that it's a one, two, three, and four already labeled as such on the balance sheet and the income statement. Now, what we'll do to make your lives easier and grading easier is every statement gets its own tab in Excel. So I'll create a tab called TFI, make it a little bit bigger so it's easier to see, and I'll start doing some copying and pasting. Equals prior current and label, copy that over. Now, the first thing I want to do is I want to take all my ones and I want to put them together. Okay, so I look for any asset ones, because I'm going to do the balance sheet first. So cash, and then inventory and PP&E are all ones. And then my other one is accounts payable. Equals accounts payable. And when I copy and paste, you'll see all my ones are kind of all together. Uh, and it gives me a nice little 
comfort feeling to see all the ones kind of bunched together. So when I net these out, I get something called operating invested capital. So it's the one assets minus the one liabilities. So that's my invested capital, 380 and 440. Okay. Just took all the ones off the balance sheet, netted them together. One assets, net of one liabilities. Do the exact same process with non-operating assets. So I look for any two that are assets, equity investments. I look for any twos that are liabilities. I don't have one in this example. I might on my homework assignment, hint, hint. Then I would put the twos on there and I'd net out the twos, just like I did with the ones. So in this case, I only have equity investments. There's my two, creating total funds available to investors, TFIs, which is my operating invested capital, my ones plus my twos. 395 and 465. Questions about what I just did? And that equals, yes? I took the operating IC, which is row six, and I added it to row eight. The operatings, the net operatings, and the net non operatings. Now, there was only a non operating asset, but if I netted them, then I would have had another you know, row nine and then the net of the two would be row 10. Okay. But since I didn't, I just added six and eight to get 10. Right? And then I look for any threes, any debt, interest-bearing debt, any fours, in this case, retained earnings, threes and fours. And by the way, when I add my threes and fours together, Notice my TF, TFI's balance. And that's what I mean by a balancing state. So the ones and twos add up to equal the threes and the fours. The buckets now balance, right? So not only do I have the answer, but I show a balancing statement. And this is what you're going to have to do for your homework assignment and for your midterm, which is a week and a half away. Questions? Hopefully pretty straightforward. All right, so we have mapped to Medigliani Miller the balance sheet. All right now, <clears throat> on this simple balance sheet, I'll give you another hint that is coming up on your homework assignment. Cash is a little tricky because what we're going to have to do with cash is we're going to have to break cash into what's called operating cash and non-operating cash. All right. So when I mentioned Apple had a bunch of cash sitting in Ireland, that's non-operating cash, but Apple still has some cash in the U.S because they got to pay people in Cupertino salaries every day. They got to have some cash to run their business. So not all cash is operating and not all cash is excess. And that's another nuance in this class. So for purposes of this assignment coming up, I'll label it separately as operating cash and I'll call it a one. And I'll have something called excess cash or non-operating cash, what I'll call it two, All right? The operating cash goes into working capital. The non-operating cash goes as a longer term asset and the non-operating assets, right? You won't have to make that determination. In the simple example in the book, right here, McKinsey called all cash operating, right? Just for simplicity. But we will get more nuanced as we go along. So just warning you about that one as you go through the assignment, okay? So follow what I've, I've given you as the ones, the twos, the threes, the fours. I'll give you a mapped homework assignment. Yes? This semester, for the most part, you will until we get past the midterm because <clears throat> then we're going to be dealing with real world statements for the companies that you're assigned and the hard part is you got to figure it out. Now we will try and as long as the statements kind of work in the Bloomberg standardized format, what you've already did in homework too is we took the most common fields that are operating from Bloomberg and we have put them in there. But we do run across companies that have these non-standard items that we might eventually have to reclassify and redo. So 95% of us will not have a problem when we do in our group projects, but one out of 20 teams might actually because there might be a non-standard item on somebody's balance sheet that we got to figure it out. And I'll help you with that, but I'm saying that's part of the real world. But the good news is most of it, because Bloomberg actually does a lot of classification for us and constantly puts it in the same buckets, is actually what makes our lives easier. 
until, as Bloomberg did last year, they changed their standard buckets. And that throws everything in a whack. And then we have to remap everything. But hopefully we won't have to do that this semester. Right? So back to this. <clears throat> We've done the balance sheet. Now we need to do the income statement. So create statement number two, tab number three. I'll call it TII. Again, make it bigger so everybody can see. Same process as the balance sheet. So what I want to do, and again, by creating everything as a new tab, it also makes copy and pasting over relatively easy. Makes your life a lot simpler. Because on your homework assignment, you'll have three years of income statements and three years worth of balance sheets and about 25 categories. So copying and pasting will definitely be easy to recreate these statements. All right. So back to this. <clears throat> income statement. Anything that's operating on the income statement goes into the operating bucket to solve for no, no plat. So equals. On the income statement, all the operatings, revenue, operating costs, and depreciation create operating profit, or in this case, EBIT. This is one of the few shortcuts I will allow you to take. right? Because everything above operating profit is operating rather than writing it three different times, we can just use operating profit to net everything above it and make our lives a little bit simpler. So to get no plat, we'll actually start with our operating profit for the current year. That's a one. And the definition for no plat is we take the taxes on the operating profit and that gets us something called no plat. Now, McKinsey calls it no plat. The rest of the world calls it no pat. And I'll use those terms interchangeably just because I work with non-McKinsey companies. But I'm just saying no pat is the common term out there. Not oper net operating profit after tax. But in the book, it's called no plat. Okay? So <clears throat> here's the idea. The way they explained it in your reading for this week is you assume that it's an all-equity firm, and then you calculate the taxes as if it were an all-equity firm. All right? But a better way to think about this is that what we want to do with the taxes, which are here, is we want to look at the taxes on each area of the business. Meaning, what's the tax impact on operating cash flows? What's the tax impact on non-operating cash flows? And what's the tax impact on debt cash flows? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to split up the taxes into each of those areas. But going back to my Lego rule, when we net all those tax impacts in all three areas, we still have to show that this company paid $66 million worth of tax. Okay, So we still have to add back to the same amount of taxes, but we're going to look at the tax on each area of the business. So let's apply that logic. If I reported $280 million of taxes to the IRS, or sorry, $280 million in income to the IRS, and my tax rate, which is given to me here at 25%, or I could solve for it by taking the tax divided by the pre-tax profit, <clears throat> and I had to pay 25% in taxes, then 280 times 0.25 is $70 million in tax, which would be my operating taxes. So my no plat is 280 minus 70, which is 210. Does everybody see that? Not 66, it's 210. So if I was just paying taxes on the operating profits, I'd pay 70 million in taxes. Questions about that number, where it came from, how I got it? Okay, so then I look at my non-operating profits off of the income statement. Equals from the data tab, non-operating profit is the equity income. That's my two. And that is four million. All right? But here's the point. If I reported four million dollars of taxes to the IRS, or sorry, four million dollars of income to the IRS, and my tax rate was 25%, how much tax would I have to pay on that equity income? A million dollars, right? Okay. Four times 
So my after-tax equity income is 3. Now, if you look at the solution that I put in the PowerPoint slide, you'll see where it says new TII and old TII. I want you to look at old TII because that's what I'm using the example here. Right? So in this example, it says after-tax non-operating income of 3, non-operating income of 4, and the average person looks at the 4 and says, how did they get a 3? Right? And I'm showing you granularly how they got a 3. Right? So it just so happens that the three authors of the book, version 6, one of them is David Wessels. I knew David Wessels when he was at McKinsey, before he got his PhD at UCLA, before I helped get him a job at Emory as a professor, and now he's a warden professor. Okay? And he's still an author on the book. Right? And the workbook writer is a guy named Mike Ciccello, who's now at Georgetown. And I've been working with Mike for eight years when he was a warden, now he's at Georgetown. And he wrote the workbook that goes along with the textbook that has all the mathematical examples. So the point is, <clears throat> um, Mike and Dave basically do this stuff for a living professionally every day, both real world and academically. So to them, it's intuitive to take pre-tax times one minus after tax when they write out these examples in the book. And they literally have spreadsheets which they've copied and pasted and sent to the Wiley Press authors that they then put into the book as exhibits. So what I'm telling you is a lot of people get confused, my opinion, like how'd you get from four to three? Right? Because what they did is they took four and they multiplied by one minus the tax rate because that's what you do. And four times one minus the tax rate is three and that's what's over there in my spreadsheet. So for your purposes, it's perfectly acceptable to write out granularly what's actually happening here. And it will probably benefit you as you start to learn how to do these statements. So that's what I'm saying. Pre-tax amount, impact of taxes, after-tax amount. The after-tax will be the cash flow, but by writing it this way, four million, million paid in tax, three net, that's the way that it actually leads to the three. Does that make sense to everybody? So what is my TII, total income available to investors? It's the 210 of no plant plus the three of after-tax equity income, it's $213 million. That's the income I have available to investors. Right? Now, to do the second half of this statement, <clears throat> you have to forget accounting. Right? This is not the statement of changes in cash flow. It doesn't work that way. It's not set up to work that way. It's really a different statement. So, let's go back. Total income available to investors literally means how much income did I make that I can distribute to my investors. Now here's the key. Both sides of these statements have to balance. So the answer, before I even start, to the other side of the statement is a positive 213. It's not an absolute value 213. It's actually a positive 213. If the TII was negative 213, the other side of the statement will be negative 213. The two sides have to actually balance. So, here's the idea. If I have income, just conceptually, if I have income, then I can distribute that income, and the two sides have to balance. Therefore, positive income leads to positive payments. Payments to investors are positive numbers on this statement. Because I have income, I can pay it out. Negative losses have to be funded by investors, which require inflows into the business. Negative losses, negative borrowing money. Okay, That's very important for the TII and the CFI statement as we go through it. So let's look at the debt. The impact on the income statement of the debt is the interest expense. The interest expense was $20 million pre-tax. Should that be on this side of the statement, it's called the financing or fund flow side, positive 20 or negative 20? Given what I just said. Positive 20. I had $213 million to pay out. 
I'm distributing 20 of that million to the debt holders. That distribution is a positive number because I have income that I'm paying out. Just the way the statement is set up. That's what we said. Don't try and confuse this with the accounting statement of cash flow because it's not set up to be the same thing. It's set up to the Medigliani Miller model. And if you try and mix the two, you'll never understand why what's happening is happening. So again, it's really, take the word, it's the income available to investors, which is the income I can pay out. So I pay out 20, so it's a positive number. Positive 20. Now, here's the next piece. The IRS allows companies to deduct interest expense as a cost of doing business. So I will have a tax shield on the debt. What is the tax shield? It's the pre-tax interest times the tax rate. In this case, equals that times 0.25. So I can write off $5 million against my taxes. So my after-tax interest expense, because of the nature of tax deductibility of debt, is 15. Again, go back to 20 of interest, 15 after-tax interest expense. That's how they got 20 to be 15. Okay. Finally, my fours off the income statement, net income, positive number, positive income, positive ability to pay it to the shareholder. Therefore, what is my TII? It's the 15 plus the 198 balancing TII. Questions? Uh, what we just did. How much did the company off its accounting statements pay in taxes? The original company was 66 in taxes. What are we actually paying in taxes here? How much tax on operating profits are we paying? How much tax on non-operating profits are we paying? What's 70 plus 1? How much tax shield savings are we getting? 71 minus 5? 66. So that's what I'm saying. You still end up with the same taxes. What you're doing is you're showing the impact of tax on each of the activities of the firm. This is the impact of tax on the operating activities. This is the impact of tax on non-operating activities. This is the impact of tax on the debt, the tax shield. And in fact, when you read the last week's homework chapters, when we do the APV model discussion, APV is all based on forecasting the impact of the tax shields. This is how you actually create what the tax shields are in the APV model. Questions about that? All right. The reason I wanted to show you this way is because this is academically how it's supposed to be done with the Benigliani Miller. And in versions 1 through 5 of the textbook, this is how they did it. But in version 6 of the textbook, they did it a different way. All right? The book that we're using, they changed it. So this is what's actually in for TII, this example for TII. And what they did is they put all of the taxes for the business, operating taxes here of 70, matched the taxes here. And then they did something kind of weird with the taxes there to get to 70. And I was trying to figure this out. I was like, how did you get to 70 versus 66 on one side of the statement versus the other? Because we should still add up to 66. So I called Wessels. I said, David, explain to me what happened. And this was his honest answer. His honest answer is that Tim Kohler, who runs our New York practice, was hearing from McKinsey's consultants that real world companies were having trouble actually applying the methodology to their existing financial systems. It was too hard for them to reallocate taxes into an operating, non-operating, and debt equivalent tax cash impact given the real world accounting systems that they had. And so what they did 
in version 6 of the book, because their market are CFOs, controllers, and treasurers, and it's the controllers of the organization that control the accounting systems. Basically what they did is they made an adjustment to simplify for their clients the ability to calculate taxes by not putting them in three buckets and just putting them in two buckets, the operating and the non-operating, and not worrying about the debt tax yields because it was too hard for their accounting systems to keep track of that. So basically what they did is they took a shortcut. And it's now harder to actually do, in my opinion, because when I first explained to you about how to separate out the taxes, my guess is that will make sense to you. When you actually follow what's in the current chapter reading for the book, it will be harder to figure out. And the answer is, it's the way it's done, which I don't like those answers. I want to understand why. And so the reason it's done the way it's done is they made a shortcut to make it easier for their real world clients. And they had an internal debate when they were editing version six. And they said, should we stay academically true or should we make it easier for our clients to implement? And they went on the side is easier for the clients to implement. And that's what's actually in there in version six. And by the way, none of this is in the textbook saying it this way. But the point is, <clears throat> even a McKinsey, which does things in an academic way, will make adjustments to the statements. And that's the point. I want you to understand conceptually why they made the adjustments so that when you see an adjustment, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that they're trying to be practical about the way it's being done. Right? But for purposes of this semester, as you're learning and doing it yourself, you guys are going to do it the more traditional way, the harder way. In my mind, it's actually easier conceptually, but it takes a little bit more work. And you're going to put the taxes into the three different ways. That's why I took out of version five of the textbook, the solution, as opposed to the version six example, because the version six example, to be honest with you, I don't know how to be able to explain it to you in a replicable way. Where the, the version five you can replicate what I just told you to do, and you will replicate what I told you to do because it will become more straightforward. Right? But this is what I mean by it gets real messy in the real world because you got to deal with this stuff every day. Right? But as I said, when people do these things, by understanding what's going on with the theory, you'll understand that people made a shortcut choice. And as I said, it's not a question of right or wrong. It's just, hey, they, they made a shortcut. And I understand that that's something they had to do to complete their valuations. All right. <clears throat> so... Now we'll go on to statement number three, which is CFI. Everything we've done to this point is to get us to cash flow. So here's the point. This is what's key to the valuation. And it doesn't matter whether you did the income statement or balance sheet first, the conversions. You can start either one. However, you have to have both converted statements to create statement number three, which is CFI. Okay, so statement number three is CFI. And so the, the general idea of cash flow is cash flow from the income statement minus cash reinvested in the balance sheet. That is a process that we're about to do four times. Cash flow from the income statement, no plat. Change in the balance sheet, investment, invested capital equals free cash flow. Non-operating income from the income statement, change in non-operating investments in the balance sheet, non-operating cash flow. Payments to the debt holders on the income statement, change in the debt on the balance sheet, cash flow of the debt holders. Actual payments to the shareholders, dividends, change in equity on the balance sheet, buybacks or issues is the cash flow to the equity holders, okay? So that's the process we're gonna go through four times to get CFI. Last few years, when I've done this homework assignment that you're about to do for homework four, the average person took one hour, but with standard deviations, some people took five hours or more and then gave up, and they couldn't finish the assignment out of frustration, mainly because of this statement. The first two statements, most of 95% of you will get right and get it right relatively quickly. The CFI, some of you will never get right and will get really frustrated. Please don't break your computer screens, right? But that's what's part of your homework assignment for Monday. So let's go through this so you're not in the give up, take five hour club. All right, so how do we do CFI? 
create tab number three, CFI. All right, equals. Let's carry over my labels here. All right, bucket one. Cash from the income statement is called gross cash flow. The definition that was in the reading for this week for gross cash flow equals from the TII, no plat, plus depreciation. That is the definition of gross cash flow. These are both ones. I'm adding depreciation, so I'll flip the sign. So my gross cash flow is 230 million. <coughs> gross cash flow minus gross investment equals free cash flow. What is gross investment? Gross investment equals from the TFI is current invested capital minus previous invested capital plus current depreciation. Invested capital minus invested capital plus depreciation. There we go. So change in invested capital plus depreciation. That's my gross investment. What is my free cash flow? Gross cash flow minus gross investment. And you might say, gee, how did he know to add back depreciation here? All right? So this is a correct answer. This is all you have to do for your homework. But let me show you a granular way of looking at this. So one of the things we're going to do next week is we're going to take TFI. We're going to do a little bit of rearranging. So what I'm going to do with my invested capital I'm going to insert a row here, and I'm going to move my long-term assets down, and I'm going to move my current assets and liabilities and put them together so that I have something called operating working capital, which is the current assets minus the current liabilities. And my pp and &E, I don't know why that got screwed up, but okay. So working capital plus pp and &E equals invested capital. So I get the exact same invested capital, but what I've done is I put it into current and long term working capital and long-term capital. Part of the reason is after the midterm we do valuation, instead of just forecasting total capital, we're gonna forecast short-term working capital needs grow at a different rate than PP&E long-term capital, okay? So it will help us when we do forecasting to separate it out this way. By the way, this is another example of why if you're not reading the book and following the convention in this class, you're gonna fail the midterm and fail the final exam. Because if you use Investopedia, you will get an incorrect answer for working capital. Because if you go to Investopedia, you start using Google, then you're going to get current assets minus current liabilities. In this class, that's not working capital. Because we will take non-operating current assets out of the equation. So for example, cash will be divided into operating and non-operating, and excess cash goes to a two. Debt, current portion of long-term debt and short-term debt is a three it's pulled out of current liabilities and moved to the debt equivalent cash flow. So you must follow the process that's in the book 
when you do the formulas to create what we're doing here today. So again, this is operating working capital, net pp and &E. So here's the point. What is cash flow? It's the change in working capital, specifically operating working capital, which working capital went from 125 to 150. Sorry, it went from, hold on, it went from 80 to 90, went up by 10. And it's something called capital expenditures. If we don't have CapEx, we can solve for CapEx. The formula for CapEx is current year net PP&E minus previous year net PP&E plus current year's depreciation. 10 and 70 is 80. That's how we got to 80. Okay, so here's the point. What, how did I get 70 for CapEx? If I take my starting net PP&E plus CapEx, capital expenditures, minus depreciation, I get my ending net PP&E. That's just accounting. You guys already intuitively know that. So here's the point. Solve for CapEx equals end net PP&E minus start net PP&E plus depreciation. So that's how I got the 70. But here's the point. When I sum them up, change in invested capital plus depreciation, that's where the plus, plus depreciation comes from. It comes from the formula to solve for CapEx. Right? So back to this. That's why I know that this is a correct answer. That is part of my gross investment. That is my operating free cash flow. Questions? Okay. Next. So this is gross investment is change in net, change in invested capital plus depreciation. Non-operating cash flows. From the income statement, from my TII, it will be my after-tax equity income. It'll be the three million. From the balance sheet, change in equity investments equals, they went from 15 to 25. And then I want to get my cash flow available to investors, my CFI. <clears throat> when you're setting it up the first time, I don't know how to explain this other than you're going to have to use common sense. You can't just plug and chug, right? I know that's really hard for you, but that's something you're going to have to do on this homework assignment. So it's important for cash flow available to investors is you have to think about each line item and whether it will add to cash flow available to investors or take away from cash flow available to investors because that will tell you whether or not it's a positive or a negative sign. Right? So here's the example. <clears throat> Free cash flow, positive 150. Should that add to the cash flow I have available to pay out to my investors or does that take away? It should add, right? Okay, if I generate $3 million of after-tax equity income, does that add to the cash I can pay out or does that take away? Adds. If I spend $10 million investing in another company, does that add to the cash flow I can distribute to my investors or does it take away? Takes away. So this should actually be a negative 10. So my CFI is that plus that plus a negative 10 is, neg is positive 143. That is my cash flow bill to investors. Now, I need to get this to balance, and this is where the two tricks come into play. And if you don't follow these two tricks, you'll never get the statement to balance, and you'll be in that five-hour club. Trick number one, cash off the income statement. And the key word is cash. Is the cash actually paid to the shareholders? 
is it my net income? Is the net income the actual cash distributed to the shareholders? What is the cash distributed to the shareholders from the income statement actually called? Dividends. Trick number one. On the TII, it's the net income because you got to get the accounting statement to balance. But in the cash flow statement, it's the actual cash given to the shareholders, which is the dividends, not the net income. So in the CFI, dividends. The dividends were negative 103. Positive or negative number? Think the same way about the TII? It's a distribution. Positive number. Okay. Then, I'd actually skip a step. Should have done the debt first. Equals off the TII. It is the after-tax interest expense. Fifteen is a positive number in this statement. It's the change in the debt. The debt off the TFI went from two twenty-five to two hundred. They paid off twenty-five million dollars worth of debt. On this statement, is that a positive or a negative number? They paid off the debt. It's a positive number. Finally, equity. Did they buy back any stock? Well, I don't see any account that says that they did. So all we have is the change in retained earnings. So retained earnings went from 170 to 265. Positive or negative 95. Okay, those are my only fours. When I sum them up, I should get 143. So maybe this is a positive 95. Trick number two, retained earnings is a non-cash count. Change in non-cash counts do not affect cash flow. If you put every item on there, and those include non-cash items, your statement will never balance, no matter how many pluses or minus and permutations you create. And that's when you give up. So, two things, and I'm just telling you, these are the two things which cause people to give up because they didn't read the book and they didn't listen to class. Number one, dividends on the CFI, not net income. On the TII, you have to use net income because we're reorganizing a statement that has to balance from the accountants. On the CFI, we're tracking cash flow. So it's dividends, not net income. Second, change in non-cash accounts do not affect cash flow. Retained earnings is a plug, right? Change in a plug is not a cash flow. The cash flow is the cash. Right? So again, if you put those non-cash accounts and retained earnings is the only non-cash account you're going to have to deal with in your homework, you won't get the statement to balance. So this gets you to a balancing statement. Right? Those are the two tricks you'll have to deal with. Let me give you trick number three, which was not on here, but this is another big hint. <clears throat> Change in excess cash is a two. So on your CFI, the change in excess cash is going to be like a change in equity investments. All right? Here's the metaphor you need to use for change in excess cash. So I have a checking account by which I do all of my bill payments and daily transactions. I have a fidelity account, which is my long-term savings that I put money into and I gamble in the marketplace. So <clears throat> here's the point. I don't pay bills out of fidelity, even though I could. I treat it like a savings account. So money that I put into Fidelity, I don't use to pay any of my bills. It's my long-term investments. And if I need money from Fidelity to pay my bills, I sell the shares in the you know, ETFs or mutual funds or stocks, and I transfer it back to my checking account so I can pay bills. 
Fidelity is like excess cash. Right? Checking account is like operating cash. What happens when you take, from a CFI perspective, cash in your checking account and send it to Fidelity? What happens when you increase your excess cash as an impact on CFI? Is it a positive or negative impact on CFI? If CFI is the funds that you can actually distribute out of your checking account. It actually decreases your excess cash. So this is the other hint that I'll give you, is that when you have an increase in excess cash, it reduces the total funds that you can pay to the investors, so your cash flow to investors go down. Okay, Because you're literally putting money to the side, and you're saying, I'm not going to pay that out, so I have less money to pay out. When you reduce your excess cash, okay, when your excess cash goes down, then it has a positive impact on CFI because you have more cash to pay out because you've rated your savings account and you're using that money to pay it out. That's the other hint that I'll give you as you deal with the homework that is not on here that will be on the homework assignment. So those are the three hints and that is the homework. The homework is due at 10 a.m. for all sections on Monday. You don't need Bloomberg. Later today, I'll just post an Excel file and here's the other key. This is an individual assignment. You individually have to learn how to do this because when you get to the midterm in a week and a half, you individually have to do the midterm. So this is not a group assignment. You have questions, talk to the TAs, all right? But again, do this individually. Okay, see everybody on Monday. What's the, uh, this number three, after-tax EI? That's the after-tax equity investment income. So oh, again, income. Okay. That the equity income, that was that number. I just used okay. an abbreviation because okay. that's, that's a good, good clarification. Yeah, I was just getting lazy. Yeah, yeah. every single one of you put your hands on it.